Well, by God, it's it's Glenn. Glenn, we're recording right now. Google Earth by Glenn. Glenn from Liberty Lake. Glenn from Spokane. It's really you. How are you today? Uh, good morning. Good, good morning, Nick. It's uh, so great to have you with us. Uh, Al Glenn, the alphabet is done. So what are we doing? Why are we here? What's the plan? You got a few loose ends, I think, to tie up. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> like a lot of loose ends. We got uh, a lot I mean, of you, loose ends, yeah. So that's, you, you know... You started a snowball rolling. Uh, <laughs> you got to deal with it. Uh, I mean, the stuff that Jim's, he Jim's opening his box today of Part E stuff. Uh, okay. He's back from his trip. Well, let's let's start right there. So, yes, viewers, this is not a live broadcast. This is a recorded uh, Zoom chat between Glenn and I. And I think I might do a few more of these over the next few weeks as I get ready for these downtown lectures. So, as Glenn mentions, uh, yeah, we did show Z more than a week ago, but there's continuing emails. And so Jim O'Connor in downtown Portland has the Joseph Pardee notes. Glenn, do you have a sense? Is it is it complete or he's just got a portion? Do we have any sense of that? No, we don't yet. I, I think there's probably uh, it is a collection of all. He was a uh, lots of different places beside the flood. So uh, I'm hoping there are field notes in there, though. So, you know, Brian yeah. hinted that he's got some. Maybe he did check them back in. Yeah. Uh, just off the top of your head, what are a couple of other just loose ends that you've been thinking about in, in the last week or so since the episodes stopped? Well, you know, certainly parties notes the timing is still wrong, I think. You know, Jim sent a teaser uh, from the first notes that, that Pardee uh, is in the Spokane area in 1920. And he says, I think it's floods, floods caused the scablands. Joseph Pardee, 1920, and he's oh. talking about floods. So that is That's that is a big, we're going to continue to kind of follow. Maybe I should do one of these with Jim now that I think about it. I mean, um, okay, so that's kind of a stay tuned thing. Uh, yeah. Before we get into what you want to share with us today, Glenn, uh, can you remind the viewers or maybe tell the viewers for the first time, why are you so proficient with Google Earth? Were you involved in that somehow professionally? And you seem to be good with a camera as well. So what's a quick snapshot of your bio here? Well, the, the quick shot, snapshot, uh, pardon the pun there, is I was a news photographer. And uh, I worked in Lewiston and some other papers. And, and I went from news photography uh, through a long, winding career to end up at a National Reconnaissance Office and doing space space photos and uh, working with the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency doing mapping. Uh, and I was involved about 20 years ago with getting the funding uh, for an original program that turned into Google Earth. So I've been wow. using it for 20 years uh, back when it was called Keyhole. And we used it as part of the job. I mean, that was uh, when you work in that business and geointelligence, Google Earth is the platform. So I've used it for a long time and, and I'm comfortable communicating with it. Well, you are, and I don't want to overstate it here and embarrass you, but it, it, beyond J. Harlan Bretz being the main character this past winter, I think you became a main character with all this effort that you've done. So that's one of the many reasons that we're doing a little post thing here. Because, yeah. and and are you going to be at those April uh, lectures yeah. in Ellensburg? So people oh, get yeah. a chance. People get a chance to visit with you there. Okay, good. Well, without without further ado, you know, we did not talk much, Glenn, uh, by email. I think my thought was, what if you had like a little top 10 uh, Google Earth type things that you could showcase? Because full disclosure, Glenn, I feel a little bit guilty that I didn't use Google Earth as much as I thought that I would because I was so... Uh, I was trying to do so much that I, I wasn't as proficient with Google Earth as I think that I could have been with the viewers. So you've got uh, a dozen or less uh, Google Earth things you can share with us today. Sure. Yeah, I was. Uh, I wanted to kind of, uh, as I went through the notes, and I realized it's been six months since you came up with like I need some help on pan tops, uh, and and I think I've been reading Google or been reading. Brett's uh, notes every day since then, at least I'm part of it. <laughs> <laughs> we were camping on the Oregon beach and I'm sitting in the trailer uh, at night uh, typing up notes and trying to read them. So, uh, oh my God. Uh, yeah, it has been sort of a, as my wife reminds me, it's been a little bit of a session uh, to, uh, to go through these, but it's just been a fascinating read and, and, uh, and growing up here. I mean, I grew up in this area. Uh, yes. So I, I have a whole new appreciation 
uh, for the, uh, the the roads that we drive. I mean, I drove up to Schweitzer yesterday at Sandpoint to go skiing, and we drive up through Athol, up to the Rathrum Prairie, up to the Granite thing. I drive by all this stuff every day. So it's it uh, the Brett's notes uh, really brought it to life. So I've been saving a few little gems uh, over the last six months, and that's what I thought I would show you today is a few of those Good. things. Well, I'm yeah, going to be so, surprised right along with everybody else, so I can't wait. So let's go ahead and share your screen if you feel okay. comfortable there, and we'll just yep. kind of go for it. This is a blast. Thank you. Yeah, so I think this should uh, – all right, you should be sealing uh, hopefully a slide up there. Okay, yep. I am, you bet. I see it there. So, uh, all right, we're just going to dive right into this. If Thank it's you. It's going to work for me. Uh, find the, uh, the right left and right button here. Very good. Uh, uh, let's see here. Next slide. Okay, here we go. Start slideshow, I guess I should be from the beginning. Start. Uh, why is that working? From the start slide. We got all the time okay. in the world. There's no live okay, viewers. Yeah, we're, uh, we're doing something kind of weird here. It's not, uh, it's, it's not advancing. So, well, okay. let me try uh, uh, slideshow, resume slideshow. I probably lost it coming. There we go. Okay, now okay. we're going. Great, now thank you. Perfect. Uh, so, uh, you see, we're, our pictures, can you see the table on the right? Yes, sir. Okay. So, uh, uh, Brett's took a lot of notes. I mean, I, I looked at over a thousand pages of notes uh, and then the accelerated stuff, and I've read it several times. So, he, he, was, he was a lot of notes. Uh, and really, he wrote not for draft notes, but he really wrote these. A lot of these things were almost per, verbatim uh, copied into some of his papers. So he wrote mm -hmm. longhand. He wrote complete sentences. Uh, they were really a good read. Yeah. Uh, the original premise of your ask uh, was to find some of the places. So the place names that I went through uh, were clearly the ones that he, he underlined in his notes. And then I got a lot of other ones, but I did not. By any stretch of imagination of the 1,555 place names that I found, <laughs> identify all the places where he took he he looked at. Okay. <laughs> I mean, this guy was just just uh, a machine uh, going out to them. But you can get a kind of a sense for uh, the the size of or the number of notes they took each year, the pages, and then some of the page counts that I picked up. So uh, so for viewers looking through those, I mean, 1,500 place names is not all he was. Yes. Uh, this was kind of interesting. Uh, again, uh, for the couple of years that, uh, that Joel did the, the mapping and the tracking on how far he went, you know, of the 11 years that he was out there, I think he probably went over 20,000 miles. No kidding. Of travel. Yeah. And if you if you look at the area, that's he was covering a 600 by 600 mile square mile area. Huh. That's that's a third of a million square miles he was looking at. <laughs> And, and when I drew a kind of a point cloud around the, the field sites by just taking out some of the areas he wasn't, that averaged about, Google Earth calculated about 200,000 square miles. So, you know, that's 1,000 or 2,000 observations. He's still, uh, you know, covering every 10, 10 square miles. Hey, I'm going to inter I'm going to interject every yeah. once in a while. I don't think we need to oh, do Cochise. We don't have to do Cochise necessarily, but let's I, no. just every once in a while. So... That that this is very helpful to see this and have that thought, Glenn. And then I immediately go to thinking about his critics uh, in the 1927 meeting at the ambush meeting or a few other situations. And they're like, how about this one little canyon and this one little sediment layer? How do you explain that? And I, I just imagine him just screaming, look, I have an explanation for 200,000 square miles, you dumbass. Not one, yeah. you know. And, and so yeah. that that must have been just infuriating to have seen so much and yet have somebody with such uh, precise criticism from one little spot. And, wow. and sitting in Washington, D.C. when they made the criticism. Yes, exactly. Uh, <laughs> wow, okay. Not out there in the field. So uh, right. uh, it was. It, this was not a, a project where he looked at a, a glacier or lake and covered 10 square miles. This is yes. 200,000 square miles. Wow, it's thank you. It's a big area. Yeah. Uh, it's a big area. So I, I found that interesting when you try to sit back at, 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 and look at, at that. Yes. Uh, 
So here's a, you know, this is not a top 10 list, but there's probably, cause there's more than 10, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll start there. There you go. Uh, you know, he, he, again, he was exhaustive and detailed and I found all the places that he talked about. So it took a while, but it is, but he was, so he was, I'm saying is he was really good at describing where he was. Yes. Uh, uh, that he, it was a, another research, another person today could go out there and follow his notes and retrace his steps. Huh? Uh, mostly. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the notes were written longhand uh, and you've seen those, some of those cursive ones and then he transposed them to a typewriter and I'll get back to that in a second. But, you know, the video you had of Rudy, uh, he took his notes and typed them up every night in camp. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I could see him doing that uh, and camp for them was pretty darn primitive. I mean, we're out in the sagebrush at Oak Fellow yeah. Uh, yeah. With, a, with a little lantern or something. He's out banging away on his typewriter. Huh. Uh, he wrote his notes in a form that were really nearly ready for publication. Hmm. Uh, and he did pull, you know, some paragraphs right out of his notes, right into his papers. Uh, and I, I noticed those, I don't have any examples, but I noticed those quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, he writes his notes in a, in a way that will be a great audio book. And we're going to test that out a little bit later uh, in a couple of minutes. But I, I think you could take his notes and they would be great listening to him read uh, his notes. Huh. Uh, they're observationally dense. I mean, he just observation after observation after observation. Every sentence is another observation. Yes. Uh, and so it was it was pretty impressive. And we'll see some of that in a bit. Uh, again, it is. He doesn't really mention any traveling party notes at all, except when he gets to 1952 and he starts mentioning some other people that are with him. But this mm -hmm. was all business in his mm -hmm. notes. Mm -hmm. So. Um, so uh, 1927 was kind of, I think, his revenge tour. Uh, <laughs> but you, know, you look at it in 66 days, how many places he was in the Northwest. I mean, from Pocatello to Wenatchee. And uh, you know, it, he went he went to everywhere yeah. uh, in 1927. Yeah. Uh, I think perhaps to prove him wrong, but this was the cover of one of his notebooks. He kind of kept a, a running uh, a summary of... Uh, of where he was, but huh. that's, I don't think I can even drive that today and hit all those towns. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> all right. Exactly. Nuts. And he's doing this in a, in a Ford or a Dodge touring car on the on crappy, dusty dirt roads. Right. Uh, that's even more impressive. It really is. This is, this uh, is so, you're doing a beautiful, you're doing a beautiful job. Glenn. This is just what I was hoping for. Please keep it going. Okay. So and I mentioned this before. He wrote a friggin' stagecoach. And it's not like a, was it, they were, it was Uber or Uber by stagecoach back in the 1920s. Huh. And you just think about these doing, you know, there's, there's aerial photography and stagecoaches at the same time. That just, that was amazing. Huh. That was really quite amazing. Uh, you know, we talked about the trade stuff. And, uh, and I like his observational car platform geology. I mean, he's kind of right up front about it uh, and what he called it. But uh, uh, in the map below, those are the blue lines that, uh, that uh, Joel uh, tracked out in, in, uh, in 22 and 23. Yeah, uh, just, so. just to remind the viewers, this is not Joel Gombiner. This is viewer Joel from, from Sacramento who's, who made that beautiful map for the first field season in 1922. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, it'd be fun to eventually to see all the other ones. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. then he was by car more or less. That by by twenty four, as as Rudolph mentioned, uh, he brought the family along, mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, that was he kind of switched to roads. I think probably at that point. Yeah. Uh, again, he's got this wonderful scarcasm, uh, car window geology of exceptionally high value. <laughs> 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 Just, he's pretty proud of that as well. Uh, but again, this is from a, a, a trade car yeah. uh, uh, taking it from the down the gorge from uh, Kennewick, uh, uh, taking the trade over to Lyle. Uh, you know, you know, Glenn. The yeah, just for what it's worth, I think maybe Rudy was off by one year. I, I I meant to kind of double check that, but like I think twenty five was maybe the first time he was out with by automobile with his family, and twenty four. I mean, it's misleading to see car window, but I, I, he's clearly talking about the train right here. So, yeah, um, yeah. I don't know. I don't know if it matters, but uh, he well, he was, there's no clue of it in his writing if that his family is with him. So they could have been. Yeah. You couldn't tell it from his notes. Right. Uh, right. Yeah. 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 So 
Thank you. Uh, so that's great sarcasm. So he had, he, you know, he didn't have a GPS. This was kind of an interesting section I came across with. He's at Micah and he's trying to figure out the friggin' altitude and is mm -hmm. painted on the train station. Uh, uh, except it's been repainted on the train station. Oh, wow. <laughs> cool. Wow. That's nice. <laughs> so, uh, I love and, it. And he, but he was packing around. Uh, back in those days, the USGS published the Dictionary of Alt Altitudes. Hmm. And he packs his dictionary around with him that has all of that, all the, the benchmarks that the USGS had established at that time. Huh. Uh, but uh, so he sets his alt altimeter and goes off and, and looks for some uh, some granite stuff. And then in 20, uh, then he's a little bit later, he's down at Willow Creek. And so here he's, you know, he, he set, he's using that, the uh, uh, altimeter and yeah. it's 1494 one day. And the next day it's, uh, he's off by uh, nine feet. Ah. So you know, that's that's hard to keep track of the uh, of his elevations yeah, uh, yeah. as they're moving around and he didn't have today's tools. So that was kind of interesting that he uh, because for him, the floods are all about altitude. Yes. To, to figure out where the water flowed and, you know, we could drop a, uh, a, a water layer at Google Earth in seconds and, and he didn't have that. Right. Uh, so this was interesting to see how he fought with altitude. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's a case where uh, uh, he's this was, I think, from 1924. But uh, but he doesn't he's trying to remember the altitude of boulders near Lyle and Sam. And, it, and he's remembering exact altitudes. Wow. Uh, and, and, and and he knows these boulders by name, apparently. Uh, but that's, just, <laughs> you know, that's and that's this is throughout his uh, throughout his notes. Just uh, he he knows this stuff and he keeps it in his head. And like, oh no, wait, there was a rocket seven fifty, not nine fifty. Uh, <laughs> you know, so that's 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 impressive right there. Yes. Uh, oh, so so the typewriter was interesting. I mean, I I was fascinated by the by the. But the typeface that he used, uh, it says all caps, but it turns out it's all caps and then all caps. Uh, so I think this was this was likely the typewriter that he used and the typeface he used. I love it. Uh, interestingly, uh, so I had somebody ask me yesterday, uh, I was talking about it, and and they said, well, why just all caps? So I, and I read, as I'm doing this research, that during the Depression, uh, typewriter manufacturers dropped lowercase letters to save money to no make them cheaper kidding, really yeah. my god <laughs> it was cheaper to print uppercase typewriters than it was to make upper and lowercase wow. so uh i just that was interesting so this is the typeface it's something called modern double gothic it came on a remington portable uh i, I think that was probably the typewriter he used huh. uh in in uh in drag around that so uh, yet another rabbit hole, but uh, okay. Well, you know, it, I, this isn't for everybody. I mean, I've, I've learned that this winter. Th this whole deep dive into history is not for everybody. Okay, fine. But it's, yeah. it's enough of us are fascinated by this. And each of these details that you're sharing with us today, Glenn, it really brings out a bunch of things that I was not really emphasizing. So I, I think if people were watching all the letters with us this winter, we have the broad strokes. And now these details just pop, I think, for those that have been with us the whole winter. So this is just outstanding. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, and this is just, you know, I came across his shopping list. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is about 1920, I think, when he was still taking, he was still looking for sats up grapples at this point. Yeah. Uh, but, but this is what he, he and the, the students were eating in camp. Uh, you know, pancakes and bacon, uh, three quarts of syrup for two breakfasts. These guys were sugar caffeinated, <laughs> for sure. <laughs> but, uh, and, and, and for supper, uh, for those who don't know, Frida is malto meal. These guys are eating malto meal for dinner. Like, that's not a dinner. Holy uh, at least cow. not today. Wow. Uh, uh, but it's, so it's just got uh, 75 chocolate bars, uh, 12 boxes of raisins. Uh, it, it's just fascinating to, to, to see yes. how they did this in the field. Yes. Uh, friction top cans, uh, which means you got to screw the top, I guess. Uh -huh. Here's another one where you need to get film and coffee and oatmeal and cornmeal and, and, uh, and raisins and cheese. Huh. Uh, it, it, it really personalizes 
Yes. I think what he was doing. Yes. Uh, and you get a little bit of their sense of who he was and what he went through to do all this work a hundred, hundred plus years ago. Yes, exactly. Uh, so uh, this was a little jib. He, he took pictures, but he took pictures of wildflowers of black and white film, but he had to write down the colors of the flowers. <laughs> <laughs> so he come back later. <laughs> this guy was obsessed about detail. Uh -huh. uh, he really was. Uh, uh, it was just fun. Uh, you know, some of his illustrations, he was he did do a lot of drawing. Uh, basalt and loose. Okay, that kind of tells the story. Yeah, but, right. Uh, 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 but uh, he had some ones a little more complicated. So this was kind of interesting. Uh, you know, I looked at, because er Erica's, paper had her field notes at the end I'm like huh well i wonder what her field notes look like compared to brett's uh, yes this is the mass this is the master student of uh, scott burns so the scott burns episode where he was talking about some uh, paleo sols in the columbia river gorge that's erica medley thank you yeah so this is from the same spot the dalles uh a hundred or let's see a hundred years ago so this he was there in august 10th she was there in on august 3rd ah. uh so uh, you know, she's got drawings and he's got drawings. And in this case, he was looking for an elephant's tooth. Uh, but mm. uh, uh, you could kind of see the style of, uh, of, uh, of note taking uh, then and now uh, and mm. the detail that they, they put down. So that was it was interesting to compare compare uh, notes. Let me put you uh, on the spot for a second, Glenn, yeah. if you can go back to that once. So I remember asking yeah. during the Scott Burns show, I wonder if Brett saw this outcrop that apparently is controversial among O'Connor versus Burns versus Bjornstad and others. Uh, do you happen to remember anything about that road cut? I think it is it 197 coming into the Dells. Was there an outcrop there at all? I'm not sure oh, yeah. there's, there was. Yeah, there was. Yeah, I could probably find it here. Uh, I was going to ship look at something here, but we can go. Let's just go out and find uh, Medley's uh, stuff. I've got, uh, you know, unfortunately with Google Earth now, you end up with uh, a thousand different uh, 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 place bills that it's a little harder to find. So let's see what Eric goes down the Dalles. There's the Dalles right there. Highway. Oh, it is one eighty seven. Good. Yeah. So so. Uh, so, so there's the road cut. Uh, let's see, how do we do this? Because I, there we go. I don't, okay. I don't mean to derail you, Glenn. I'm just, I'm just wondering oh, if, no. there, if there was a road cut there in 1921, that would be fascinating that he was looking at yeah. that same face. Well, so uh, it's hard to miss it. I mean, as you, this is uh, going to switch the street view. He's got to drive up this road to the, to the. Uh, how do you miss that when you're driving up the road? <laughs> But we think there was, I wonder if, if we could find a highway map from 1921, if there really was a highway coming right up there. There was. Yep, okay. there was. Right. Okay, yeah. thank you. So, you know, so he's, it's a little hard ah. to miss up these spots there. Yes, yes. Uh, exactly. That. I think that's the old highway over there. Oh, uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. Huh. So, uh, you know, right. that's, well, so that's one of the cool things about Google Earth is, is uh, you know, to be able to merge all these generations of, uh, of information together and kind of fuse it. And, uh, and, yeah. and see and, and blend it up. So uh, I don't think the Google Earth data, yeah, you didn't use all of it to show, but, but, that, but so what? I think it's, it's out there now and, and pe other people can use it to track that. Thank you. Uh, yeah. So uh, let's see, uh, field notes. Uh, again, he was a good writer, uh, sometimes flowery, uh, but you know, this coolies with smiling fertile farms and streams and lakes on their floors, the somber red brown framing mural escarpments. I mean, that's <laughs> that's poetic. Uh -huh. uh, that uh -huh. is poetic. Uh, and, uh, and that's pretty neat. Uh, and that is like, here comes the perhaps, uh, maybe not. So he's, he's, his writing has some humor in it as well. <laughs> uh, and, and that's kind of neat. Um, so this is, um, uh, 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 I wanted to have you read this. This is, a, he made a trip in 1937 at the bequest of Guy Atkinson, uh, who was one of the four contractors on Grand Coulee to come out and look at, uh, uh, at the gravel pit that they were building Grand Coulee Dam out of. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and the, the report 
Brent basically says, uh, well, if you would have had a geologist on site when you started digging up, you would have found out that you're using glacial till, not gravel. And, uh, and that's probably not a good way to build a dam, but whatever. Uh, huh. uh, and, and interestingly, so this was the, the gravel pit that he was at. Let me go back to that. How did I miss those 37 notes? Did I post those and then just not look at them? No, I don't think you posted them. Okay. Uh, they're attached, so I have a hunch you probably will now. Okay, uh, yeah. Because it's a great, great story. Huh. Uh, so here's the gravel pit that, that, he's, that he was sent out to, to, uh, uh, to check out. I uh, see. Out of Grand Coulee Dam. Interestingly, let me hide this here, uh, that uh, as they did swim this around, so that was a gravel pit that they uh, they used to get the gravel for Lord Grant Dam. This pile, this is all the sand and <laughs> unusable material they had to filter out to build the dam. Uh, but but this is what Brett's came out uh, to. That's the subject of this this story. I and see. So this is just a this is just the first couple of pages, but it's absolutely a wonderful story. Huh. Well, you want me to read it? Sure. Okay. We'll make what? an audio. This is my point about audio books. This is, okay. This, is, this right. is make a great audio book. Very good. Well, let's give it a try. Why couldn't it be that the car was stationary, that it was simply rising and falling as a procession without visible end of hills and valleys flowed under it? These are the loose hills of the Columbia Plateau west of Spokane. As they flowed eastward beneath us, they carried great sheets of wheat stubble foam interspersed among blank, black areas of summer fallow. Houses, barns, grain elevators all flowed along with the fields and fences. Anyway, whether they flowed or, or we, Grand Coulee was getting nearer and nearer. The weather was getting warmer and warmer, the pavement less treacherous with those icy stretches. The snow more and more limited to northern hill slopes and the shady sides of fences and barns. We reached the plateau summit without once skidding dangerously. We saw the car behind us take the ditch and roll over, but we didn't dare stop. <laughs> we safely passed the point 500 feet above the Columbia where tomorrow a car would skid through the guardrail and plunge 150 feet sheer, bringing instant death to the three men in it. Like, wow. Good Lord. We wound around the intermingle, descending curves, dropping lower and lower, the Black River getting larger and larger, and that insignificant dam getting longer and longer. We passed through Shantytown. Hundreds of cheap little shacks sprawled about on the rocky knolls and snuggling down in the hollows among them. 5,000 people living where only sage and jackrabbits lived six years ago when I last looked on this terrain. Papa Atkinson and I sat in the rear seat embedded, embedded in luggage. Sharply and almost continuously he warned George of the curves, of possible ice and other cars, of such speed. George was sharp in rebuttal. Mrs. George soft-pedaled them. I remained discreetly silent on the subject, remarking only that I, I got, got 145,000 miles out of my Dodge before it turned it on. And then they, however, are getting a Lincoln Zephyr ordered it yesterday. This rain and snow, they said, was their first taste of winter. It would clear up tomorrow, sure. <laughs> ah, man. Crazy, man. I just, I'm perfect to, to, to pick a section like that. Yes, the way he writes, but just, I mean, I didn't realize he was back in the late 30s. I'm just, I'm dumbfounded by that more than anything else. Crazy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a, uh, so uh, for those uh, who want to read, I'm sure you'll post uh, that, uh, the file and uh, they can read the whole story. And it, it just, it goes on. It's just an absolutely 
great read. Uh, I sent a copy to, I have a friend who's a, uh, a professional uh, novelist. Uh, she's got six or seven uh, novels out uh -huh. and she's uh, part of the Virginia Writers Guild. Uh, I've actually judged some writing contests for them, but uh, I said to her, she says, you know, this is fascinating, detailed writing. Yes, it's <laughs> old school way of writing. Right. Uh, she could tell it was written a long time ago, but she says his detail uh, is, is really superb uh, and, and thought it was really the professional novelist thought it was really good writing. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. uh, so there's some, there's, and again, this would make, I think, a great audio book. Yeah. Uh, uh, as you're driving over to Grand Coulee and trying oh, to slow down. Good idea. Uh, huh. So that's, that's a, that's a great, great example of, of, of what some of the stuff that's in uh, Brett's material. Thank you. Uh, some more, uh, you know, so he's, he loves the Scablands. Uh, never have I seen Scablad a basically portrait. It's closer than airplane view. Uh, never hesitate about going into superlatives and describe the gash and candid character of the Scablads. Mm. <laughs> I never realized how many there were. Uh, so <laughs> I'll just say a bunch of Scablads. You know, so that's just that's you know, uh, fascinating uh, details. Uh, so in twenty nine, uh, you know he's. He's now thinking that there's an ice dam that might have gave way huh. and caused all this. Huh. Uh, and, and this is, of course, now that we've got the Part E notes who Part E is saying, well, I know that the scablands were caused by the floods uh, yeah. 10 years ago. Wow. Yeah. I, I mean, how much of that we we try to figure out in the next month? I mean, the clock is kind of ticking, but it would be fun to, to do a couple of major changes to the narrative even before early April. So I don't know. We'll, we'll keep lighting a fire under O'Connor maybe to keep rolling with it, what he has. This is exciting. Yeah. So, yeah, I think you're going to have some, some new information to, to put out in, in April. Nice. Uh, so nice. there's a bunch of us working behind the scenes to get that to you. Yes. Uh So this this is another one. This, is, this was funny, actually. <laughs> uh, now we know the history. <laughs> I regret, I regret to announce there were probably two of them. <laughs> yeah, so, I think I think he's earned his right to be snarky at this point. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you know, when he's talking about it was the bursting of Glacial Lake Missoula, probably. Mm. Uh, uh, so, you know, he's he's on track then, but uh, so he's now starting to, uh, I regret to announce that there were probably two of them. Uh, <laughs> You know, here's the case where he he surprises himself with his writing. Uh, this he's talking about finding some stuff over at Yakima uh, about the scablands uh, that are down in that channel. Mm -hmm. uh, but but what a discovery! And how faint my faith! I've never dreamed of finding real scabland in the Yakima construction. Yeah, he loved that Chandler Narrows. He just and Sky kind of poo pooed it when on one of those shows. But like I. He just kept talking about that stretch down there in the lower Yakima. I need to make mm -hmm. some programs down there, I think. I'm still to not totally getting why that's so such a big deal. But you're right, right here. That's one of his last major discoveries, I think, uh, of yep. the 20s. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. So, and he never, and how faint his faith. I mean, he's, these are notes he's writing, and it's just wonderful right. uh, how, how, how good they are yes. uh, and how readable they are. Yeah. Uh, so here's the thing. He was proposing that Lake Columbia should have been uh, Lake Salisbury. Hmm. Interesting. Wow. Uh, well, Salisbury was an influence for sure. Yeah. So he was he was kind of lobbying for that uh, back in this is 1922. Oh, because he just passed away. I think I think Salisbury just died uh, like a, a week earlier or something. I OK, think, well, that uh, makes sense. Yeah. Because uh, hmm. uh, as, as Jim re reminded me the other day, you got to be dead to get something named after you. Okay. Uh, so. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I do remember that that first field season, I think it's August 15th, that Salisbury died unexpectedly, and here he is kind of still out there in the scablands thinking about this mentor. Wow, uh, that's powerful. Thank yeah, you. and he must have got a newspaper of it because how did he find out about this? Right, uh, right. Out in the yeah. field. Huh. Uh, so that's interesting uh, that he mm -hmm. wanted to name something Salisbury. Hmm. Uh, so, uh, he finds right offers. Uh, this is kind of cool. Uh, Paul Miller says it's from a right And then, uh, uh, so they're down at Walla Walla 
they're down at the on the Walla Walla State Ped where they yeah. evacuated the chapel, and the the convicts are present when they're finding uh, 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 tooth tooth uh, <laughs> down in the uh, uh, down in the loose. Uh, so. Uh, interesting story there. And, and again, he's talking with the uh, other teachers while he's out in the field too. Mm -hmm. uh, the mammoth jaw. Uh, you know, sometimes he gets sort of mixed up in his notes. Uh, he talks in, in 27 at Ritzville. There's a nice channel in the middle, uh, an island in the middle of the channel. And then he comes back and said, oh, there's two channels. Wait, there's an island. I never saw that. And I'm like, well, yes, you did. Oh, <laughs> wow. <laughs> Glenn, you are in so deep. Glenn, I hope you're still married, by the way. I mean, seriously, like you are, you are, you know these notes better than anybody at this point. Seriously. Anybody. Yeah, I, probably, I probably read them probably more than anybody. Oh, uh, yes. I didn't for get a life, sure. I guess. Uh, <laughs> this is great. So, I can I can relate, man. Once you get in deep, it's hard to get back out. This is oh, so it is. Cool. Yep, yep, yep. It it is a rabbit hole or a rabbit. <laughs> Uh, pasture. Yes. Uh, uh, so here, here is this. Here's a Steinfeld day, or Seinfeld day. Uh, a show about nothing. Yeah. <laughs> this has nothing to contribute to the study. Nothing to see, folks. But uh, but he writes the fact that there's nothing, uh, yeah. uh -huh. and that is that is itself something. Right. Uh, uh -huh. I thought that was funny. Uh, you know, so uh, he, so his notes were a lot of, uh, of his uh, consciousness, just thinking out loud or writing out loud. Yes. Uh, you know, so, uh, you know, so here he says, uh, uh, only could be one thing. And then he goes back, reads his notes later and says, oh, yeah. Party, party thought it was something else. So. I, I do love that. There, there is a bunch of that. I find that equally fascinating. Well, he a little bit, you know, see the next field season's notes or whatever. So how often he's going back and rereading these notes is kind of interesting to me. Is it is it an annual ritual that he's reading each of the previous notes to then kind of make changes? But it seems like there's all sorts of little uh, pencil marks, like you say. Uh, yeah. Um, correcting himself fast yeah he's gone back and forth and and uh i mean his these are working notes where he goes back most of the time refers to them and uh and yes he marks them up later with other yeah. data that he's got in yeah. so 42 this would have probably rolled into his uh 52 field season mm -hmm. uh maybe to check that out mm -hmm. he uh he takes his buddies around here he takes uh uh large out or large takes him out to uh uh, these uh, gravel or these uh, uh, Hauser nice knobs that are in the middle of the Spokane Valley down by uh, uh, Argonne oh. Road. Oh, yeah. uh, so he takes large out there and they look around. And that's the old Walk of the Wild uh, zoo that used to be there. Uh, but then, they, then he takes, uh, so he's trying to do, uh, find the outflow from Court Lane. So he takes large with him and sort of uh, takes him out in the field and slaps him around the head and says, uh, you're wrong. Huh. Uh, here's, huh. here's, uh, here's what it is. Yeah. Uh, so well, my, my memory of that is there was a grad student of somebody who said, yeah, or maybe of Brett's. Maybe I think he sent these grad students out solo occasionally. And so at some point, he's the grad students like, I got striations on top of this knob. You got and maybe it was the next summer. I don't know if you have it right here, but. Uh, yeah, large eventually takes him out there. I think it was. I think it was large Brett's letters like, hey, my grad student says there's striations on that knob. What do you think? And then large must have taken him out there. And then we yeah. say, OK, that's the end of that. Huh. Yep. Yeah. So Very fun. Uh, it's interesting that he's uh, uh, that he's, you know, working with these other uh, other people. Yes. So this is, uh, you know, and here he he's arguing with himself. Uh, he solves Raptor Prairie. He says it's a ground parade, uh, yeah. and then six pages later, after looking at, it, he says, "Ah, well, it's not ground parade; it's it's outwash." So, uh. <laughs> so uh, you know, again, that's just uh, uh, writing out loud what he's thinking, and it's really fascinating and adds some character to his uh, to his papers. I don't think he would find that self assessment in some of Flint's papers. He was pretty sure of himself. Yes. Well, that's interesting, right? If the Flint papers exist somewhere, that would be a weird or an interesting comparison. And I can't. I, you're you're sparking some memories from a week and a half ago. 
why didn't Brett's go back to Spokane in the restroom prairie in 52? Like it felt like so much of his late twenties work was still talking about that area. And yet he didn't go back. I wonder why. I don't, I'm not quite sure why he wedded, what he was trying to resolve in 52 uh, yeah. was it, mm-hmm. you know, clearing up some loose ends that were bugging him. Uh, it's, mm-hmm. it's not clear from his notes why he went back uh, after seemingly, you know, giving up or not giving up, but I've solved, I've solved the flood. I don't need to go back. My work is done yeah, here. Yeah. 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 Uh, that, that, that weighs on me. I wonder. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I got, I got to work on that one. That, that seems to be a pretty major question. Why is he coming back after 20 plus years? And why did he go where he went? One thought is that there's these new excavations where the irrigation canals are put in. Okay, that makes sense to me. But yeah. but why what, 52? Feels right under the paper? Yeah, yeah. There's got to be more there. That's, that's, yeah. think, that's a narrative to, to work on maybe a little bit. Yeah, so we used to end up, when I was at my other job, we used to call that bouncing the rubble. Uh, is uh, you know you've you've blown it up, let's go blow it up again. Uh, <laughs> uh, bouncing the rubble. Right. Uh, so here's uh, so these are a couple of notes. He is he is still pissed at the USGS. Yes. Yes. <laughs> and you should guys go look at this. Uh, and then uh-huh. this one. One fun's bad enough. <laughs> but, but two. That's gonna blow their minds. Uh. Uh, funny uh, but so yeah he, he's 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 funny in, in this writing um uh he has these moments uh and uh and this is the uh the narrows down to where the john where the the flood jumped the columbia river and jumped into the john day uh, uh drainage hmm. uh and uh, let me switch to that i actually showed you what uh, oh, wow. so th- this is that amazingly cool area as well uh but this is where uh the the water's coming down the columbia okay. and blows out through here and drops into so the john day river connects down here oh we're, so we're near biggs junction we're, we're downstream of biggs and upstream yeah. of the dells okay yeah, here's here's rufus and okay. Biggs junction here here's the dam yeah. Okay. So John Day River has this, this is kind of a weird, you know, why that river runs parallel for a while. Huh. But this is a spot where it, it jumped up over here and then came down through these narrows areas. Oh, wow. Uh, That's and brand- created all these bars in this huge gravel bar. Uh, uh, but his words are the most remarkable, most spectacular, most significant symbol record of the flood uh, in section six and seven. Uh of that uh, sheet and, and that's the spot i also had to go ahead you know me i dropped some light on it of course uh, uh and you can just see how the water came around that corner and then this humongous gravel bar uh that's this deposit that's there uh so that's an that, area i want to go take a look at and well, and look at that from yeah the john day side but, well thank you glenn this is a brand new moment for me i i had totally missed that i never even thought that there'd be a spot like that. Wow, thank you, Jesus. You can see there's a road that goes up it. Okay. Uh, but So there's gravel deposit on this side. This is filled by Canyon. You drive by oh. that on 90 all the time. But the water went up here and then took a right-hand turn and carved all this stuff wow. down into the John Day drainage. Mm. So uh, that's just a, uh, a really interesting, now I have a whole new appreciation when you drive the freeway, what's just up over the hill? Yes. Uh, and to check that out. Wow. Uh, so that was when he found that. It's like holy moly, uh, yep. this is amazing. Um, uh, Twenty-eight didn't start very well. He loses his field notebook. Huh. Wow. Uh, so he loses his field notebook. So he so he writes abbreviated notes for a week. <laughs> Seven pages of abbreviated notes. <laughs> abbreviated <laughs> with Brits. I don't know what that means, but it's. Uh-huh. it's <laughs> but uh, finally, he gets back into full bore. Oops, he gets back into full bore uh, a week after losing his notebook. Uh, but uh, just little details. There's this human details that I find fascinating. Yes. Uh, in this material. Yes. Uh, all right. Yeah, we got to. I think you mentioned this, but we. Uh, I got to go back and check this place out uh, to see what the picture he's talking about. 
uh, is, uh, is to photograph the scab lands and it's between Lad Starbuck and Lads Ferry. So we know the area, but uh, I could not do that. Uh, so here's sort of some, some, I guess, some final to wrap some of that up. Thank you. Uh, we're, we're not going to go three hours today. Uh, <laughs> uh, enormous amount of field work. Uh, 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 he over probably overachieved. And again, I, I don't know you know, how much work other geologists put into some of their project, but this seems like a lot. Yeah. Uh, so here's, you know, but he's got all this data and like you, I'm kind of figure out what else could, is it still, what do you do with it now? Yes. Uh, can, a, can a grad student follow it? And, and yes. Why? But, but I think you certainly could. Uh, I was really impressed how he kept track of elevations and kept all that straight in his head. Mm -hmm. uh, that is just a mem memorizing those numbers and building a, a, a flood profile in his head that now we take supercomputers to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, he was doing that. Uh, I kind of wonder, though, I mean, it, at what point it becomes overkill uh -huh. uh, and, and how many gullies and rocks do you have to turn over? Uh, it is no, he will count pebbles. He'll do, he'll count 400 people, pebbles and find 300 of basalt and 150 of quartzite and 22 of this. I mean, he's, he's counting rocks. Right, uh, right. And, and that's, that's a lot. Yeah. Uh, good, disciplined writer. Uh, his notes were pretty tight too. Uh, and then lastly, you know, writing his thinking process down and interpreting what he's seeing. Now, he, he did sort of do a lot of real-time interpretation and says, okay, I see it. I'm writing it. It's going in the paper. Uh, but I'm kind of wondering if that's a useful approach that you could, you know, have some of your students kind of study mm -hmm. those notes or use them as an mm -hmm. example uh, mm -hmm. to say, well, this is how, you know, Brett's does observations and makes conclusions from that. So uh, I thought that there was some, some value perhaps in, in, in today's geology students and learning how to take notes, perhaps. Absolutely right. I mean, I will be using it this this next spring for sure. I mean, there's there's so much there, and that's the beauty of this. That I think there's many different kinds of geologists today, and so I'm sure if we can just get this stuff in front of people's faces, there'll be many different ideas about how they can use this incredible treasure trove that's been under lock and key for a hundred years. Yeah, um, that's yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Hey, let's let's exit out of this for a second. Can you do that? Can you stop your share for just a second? And let's just yeah. kind of re regroup ourselves. And you got to yeah. drink. You got some water handy or something? I got to keep. You got to keep yeah. track of your your vocal cords, Eric. Glenn. Yeah, I, I'm. Uh, uh, it's too much yelling while I'm skiing, but I'm okay for a little bit okay. longer. Well, yeah. Let's just take a a, a a short break. I assume you have some Google Earth. You're thinking you want to share with this as well, or not? Actually, no, I was. I, this, this was. This was. Okay. I, I do. I do want to show you the lidar, though. Okay. Uh, I do. Well, I do want to show you that lidar data. Before we do that, let's just. Um, so I don't know how much of your own story you want to tell right here, but I'm just curious. Have you had a lifelong interest in geology, or? Are you like many that heard about this floods thing maybe 30 years ago and then you maybe read a book or two or went to a website or something and then it's only recently that you've gone head first into this world? Can you kind of talk about your intersection with geology just in general being a resident of Spokane and Lewiston most of your life? Well, uh, growing up in North Idaho, my grandparents had the complete set of National Geographic. Like, like many of our prayers did. Uh, yes. And when we clean out their basements, there are boxes and boxes of National Geographic. And and, and that was fast. I've read every one of those. And and so National Geographic was a, was a huge interest. Uh, I've always been a mapaholic, uh, even to the point of we used to do a lot of backpacking. And I was a navigator for all of our backpacking trips. And we went to a lot of backpacking, a lot of backcountry. So always an interest in maps. Uh, I'd say my very first college work study job uh, was interpreting aerial photographs for a forester at the University of Idaho. It was just one of those jobs. You I'm going to school. I need some money. Uh, here's a job. Go. Uh, here's a guy who needs you to look at at forest or stereo maps and count yeah. trees. Yeah. Well, that's kind of interesting. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I got I got sucked into it probably in college. 
and, and then at work uh, with my uh, experience with Google Earth, uh, I, geology. My my dad was a rock hound, but he was he would collect rocks to make belt buckles and bolo ties, and right. and he was collecting pretty rocks, not geologist type of rocks. Right. Right. Still end up with a basement full of rocks that we had to move out after after they died. But uh, it was. So, uh, so how about the floods thing? Do you remember hearing about that 30 years ago or there were articles in the paper you were working for or anything along the early thoughts of the floods? Well, yes, uh, partially because another summer job was working as a park ranger at Farragut State Park. Oh, really? And Farragut is is you know right in right in the middle of it, uh, and every morning we would go out to uh, to the point uh, where there's now a sign that talks about the floods and there's all sorts of material around there. So yes, uh, Farragut was ground zero. Uh, for I stand the right there, yeah. And, and I worked there, uh, so we would have people ask us about you know that, and so we kind of said, well, that was a flood. Okay, that's about all we do. Uh, uh, so yeah, so I, I worked at Farragut. My mother worked at Farragut in the 1940s. So uh, wow. when you grow up in Sandpoint, uh, you sort of live in it. Huh. And, uh, and my grandparents uh, uh, lived out on, uh, on uh, Trussell Creek and they lived right on the, on the edge of Pondere, overlooked Green Monarchs. Uh, we looked at Clark Fork every day we were out there. So uh, the floods were part of my life growing up uh in in sad point so you know that this now though really you know what once you start to open that can of worms when uh, you started your broadcast three years ago we we're all stuck at home and and i had a neighbor here in liberty lake say hey you know, there's this guy named nick zettner and he's got these videos out and you might be interested and, 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 and so it's on it's on you uh, well, sorry for doing well it, it's it's you you've you've been the perfect person for this with that background and obviously that's that's what we have all learned this winter you're an extreme example glenn but yes whoever said it in the last episode i think it was joel gombiner said i think some of your viewers maybe have no scientific training, but they're working at a high level. I love that phrase. He just came yes. up with that. But it was this mastery of going through a digital archive or something else or your high level. Um, it's inspiring that people have so many different kinds of talents. Okay, well, thanks for that backstory. Yeah, let's round this one out with uh, a little bit of this sexy LIDAR, which I've barely looked at on Google Earth. I'd love to see that. And then I have one more special request um, you talked more than once about just sit back with your favorite beverage and, and have some sort of automated tour. If, if we could do one of those together to round this out, if there's one that lasts, I don't know, five minutes or less, uh, be funded. If you, if you could call one of those up and sure. be funded. To yeah, see they're easy to do. Like. Uh, okay. And I'll use it as a, as a, as a teaching opportunity. Great. Uh, I think so. So right. I'll quit back to share my screen. Very good. Thank you. Um, Bear with me here. Uh, yep, take your time. To, viewers, uh, I hope you, you enjoyed this one. I'm trying to talk to the viewers. The record. The, this is this is not a live video recorded. Uh, sorry. Viewers, everybody's watching this in replay. You didn't miss a live stream. We're just doing a few of these uh, kind of, I'm just testing out this format to just do some Zoom stuff recorded. And uh, we'll just kind of keep working on some of these loose threads. So, okay, Glenn, I see your PowerPoint again. And so that's working. Um, oh, but, let me switch to my. Uh, I need to switch to my other screen here because I've uh, you got PowerPoint, but I've got uh, uh, Google Earth up and running. So uh, okay. where do we go here? Getting back to Google Earth. Let's see. Did you select? There we go. The, okay. Did you select the wrong window to share? Maybe like we're we're still looking yeah, at your. I need to stop the share of that one. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay. And now I need to share this one. I got Google Earth up. Great. Uh, let's see here. Pictures. Speaking uh, of the human two. element, we're including all this, too. Sometimes I hear from viewers and they're like, why did you do all that stuff or you didn't even know what you were doing? It's like, we're human beings, man. Human beings tend to gravitate towards other actual human beings. So we're going for it. All right. <laughs> imagine that. Yeah, Yeah. imagine uh, that. Okay. Yeah, a, we, we can oh, see beautifully uh, now. Okay. So uh, that's the narrows where we just were. Uh, let me get uh, turned around here. Get back to Sandpoint. Good. Uh, but, or yet north, and then I'm going to turn on the LIDAR. Okay. It's on. So we're going to fly back over to Sandpoint. 
So, uh, God. Uh, so, so this is LIDAR data uh, that I pulled down, and then I did some special color hill shading uh, to try to emphasize the mid-level altitudes uh, where the where the floods were. So to orient you, uh, here's here's Spokane down over here. Thank you. Here's uh, here's Liberty Lake, and uh, I live. Right, right where the B is, probably right along the Spokane River. Okay. Uh, and then we'll move into Idaho. The, so there's a little bit difference between the Washington LIDAR data that I got in the Idaho, but nevertheless. So we're going to move into, this is the Rathdrum Prairie. Yep. Here's Rathdrum. Uh, here's uh, Lake Coeur d'Alene. Uh, this is the Spokane River runs right along the edge here. This is what they talk about. It got the floods pushed the river over. Oh, uh, pushed the, the river south up and dead, up against the mountains here, and, uh, and that's where the current Spokane River. Now the interesting thing is that Anderson has that. You have that paper posted yeah. where he talks about the Coeur d'Alene, the Saint Joe. So the Coeur d'Alene, Spokane River coming out of Lake Coeur d'Alene. Uh, is relatively new geologically yeah. because you have the Coeur d'Alene River feeding in here, and you have the St. Joe River feeding into the bottom of Lake, uh, Lake Pond Ray. Wow. The earlier notes, we were talking about the overflow. So this is uh, uh, the end of Coeur d'Alene Lake, and, yeah. the, and this is Rockford and Rock Creek that comes down through here. And this is the area right through here where they think if Coeur d'Alene Lake overflowed, it would be right through here. There's an Indian casino here now and the highway goes right by it. But that's that's the channel that might have been overflow. Wow. But, was was Brett talking about that? Yes. Was he? Yes. Yeah, oh. he was a little bit. He he was in this area uh, on that. And yes, Brett was talking about uh, about that overflow or, or huh. whether or not it was an overflow at all. Right, right. Yeah. So oh. you can see uh, it's the Fernand Lake, Coeur d'Alene, Spokane River. And then now we're looking up through the, this is the old channel uh, of the St. Joe River, according to Anderson, that went north and then went up into Lake <laughs> no Pond Array. No kidding. And then went north out of Lake Pond Array. Uh, here you can see. I mean, uh, you could, the, the glacial carvings here are just uh, absolutely freaking amazing. Huh. As you can see what uh, the the glaciers did to uh, Bottle Bay and Garfield Bay. Uh, I grew up somewhere right about here, huh. right, right in Sagal. It was, huh. was miles. So so we, we would ride our bicycles up to the top of Gold Hill and, and, and coast <laughs> down when we were kids. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's that. That's that. But we never realized that you're in the middle of these of a you know the the, the glacial channels here. But you yes. can see where the glaciers. I mean, it's it's pretty much no brainer when you look at some of this data to see what happened here. Huh. Uh, here's Sad Point uh, and uh, uh, some of the channels, and then that old channel went up north of here, up through Sand Mills and the Cleed, uh, out up to the Purcell Trench up to the, this is the Kootenai River up here. So Anderson thinks the water flowed all that way until it was blocked by the glacier. Well, there's just, I mean, there's there's a, all sorts of things to say here, Glenn. We could go another three hours, I'm not kidding. But anyway, we won't. Um, no. First of all, the power of the LIDAR. I mean, it's one thing to look at pretty colors, but it's another to suddenly go off of your LIDAR into the non-LIDAR stuff, and you're like, oh my God, we lost the whole thing we were just talking about. That's stunning. And then um, when you are showing us ice sculpted landscapes, I'm immediately thinking, is it blue ice or is it red ice? <laughs> well, that's, well, so. Exactly. Because uh, <laughs> this is amazing because somebody said earlier that glaciers don't take uh, right hand turns. And like I would beg to differ. You can see where the, this is, these are the braids here uh of uh Holy of that last ice sheet and you can see geez. it came around this way so you had two glaciers slamming into each other uh right in that area uh and so, then this area yeah oh, go, go ahead. ahead uh well one please you continue and then i've got a couple basic uh google earth lidar questions for you go sure. ahead please okay 
uh, here's the old channel uh, out through here where the floodwaters I mean, carved their way through. Uh, that is absolutely uh, uh, just an amazing seed. Here's, these are current ripples. Jesus. That's all spirit over by Spirit Lake. Uh, Brett's talks about those. Uh, but these are giant current ripples from the outwash. And then you can see the channels, the various channels that it carved as it goes, as uh, some of it went out north, out through the Hoodoo Valley. And this is the, uh, this is Priest River, Newport, and it flows on down to the Sp Little Spokane River that way. Uh, but it really, the, the LIDAR, well, it makes it easy for non-trained geologists to kind of see what's going on. Well, yeah. So, so let me let me interject a couple things. So, number one, how is so? I'm so out of it. So, I'm gonna I'm gonna be, uh, ask questions that are semi insulting here. Please, Please don't take it that way. Nope. How we're looking at lidar within Google Earth. So, how is this different than just looking at straight up lidar of this area? Is it any different? Um, no. Most black most lidar you'll get from the USGS sites are black and white. Okay. Uh, so it's a little bit harder to uh, for untrained people to see black and white or understand black and white. Okay. Uh, this uh, the the tools that I use to do the colorization uh, basically all it does is it convert altitude to color. Okay. And the, the higher uh, and this and when I did it I said blue will be low altitude and red will be high, uh, but. Uh, the way LIDAR works, it, it, it tried to do some averaging. So each one of these squares is a 10 by 10, uh, 10 kilometer by 10 kilometer scan is kind of what way LIDAR, the package that comes in. Okay. So you have to stitch them together uh, and then you have to adjust the altitude so that they uh, all match. But, but basically it was taking USGS at the state of Washington uh, uh, point digital data. Most of it came from the space shuttle, uh, wow. shuttle tomography data. Oh. And uh, so you take that point data and run it through some uh, uh, processing engines. When I was at NGA, we had supercomputers to do that. And now uh, we do it on Google Earth and our laptops uh, is, is amazing. But it's pretty straightforward, uh, but to take that digital data and then overlay it on top of Google Earth. And, and Google Earth, uh, if I could show you here on the side, you know, each one of these is just a, is a cell in of itself. I don't know where it's yeah. gonna drop out that, but each one of these is a little picture that you have to put together and, and overlay on top of that. But uh, I think it helps, it helps to visualize and to see uh, uh, things that maybe you can't see in your in your mind, but if we look at where you know Brett's was and start turning on some of the places, Brett's was up there. In, well, let's go 22. Check 22 and see if his places start to show up. Where, okay, so he was in Kerry Wood. 24, 25, 26. He's starting to circle in on that. So he's also uh, keep checking these. So you can see that Brett's was kind of all through, sure through that through that area, well, and so that's kind of fun to to merge all that together too. Well, it's and, it's kind uh, of it's what I'm driving at here, Glenn. I, I I I'm, you know, I deal with enough geologists who say, yeah, we're excited, we got the new lidar for such and such, and we've been zooming around in lidar, and I'm like, I don't even know how to do that. How do you find the lidar? And they go, oh, well, you just go to the Washington State portal. It's real easy. And I'm like, I. I the most basic things about even acquiring the LIDAR and then viewing it are difficult for a person like me. To me, what you're doing is you're making this, you're giving more gifts to the viewers where you're saying, look, if you know how to get to Google Earth, I'm giving you the LIDAR as well. You're not having to download anything. You're not having to get anything else. Isn't that really what you're doing here for us? That you're taking the LIDAR and getting it to a format where some of us can operate at the most basic level. Yeah, that's, that's uh, well, I did it for myself so I could see it. Sure, <laughs> You sure. guys are extra credit. Right. Uh, but uh, <laughs> it, 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 uh, I'm a visual person and it helps me understand uh, and helps you see these things. And, and, uh, and uh, 
uh, understand it. So it's, it's really not that hard. I, before I come off the screen, I wanted to show you something. So these Good. are the little town of Bayville is right here. Yeah. These are glacial kettles. Good God. Carved by the wall. Uh, this glacial kettle here is the Farragut Amphitheater. This is the, the, the park <laughs> amphitheater that, that seats 40,000 people have been in this hole. <laughs> That blows my mind uh, a, a little bit, uh, but let me so let me quickly over and show you. you know, we're just go everywhere here. I want to get to uh, where my uh, browser go. We don't want to uh, go to Zoom. We don't want to go to uh, Zoom. We're already on. No, Zoom. we don't. No, we want to get to here, and we want to go to. So here's the Washington lidar portal. Okay, oh, I just slammed him. I now just, we now you can show me how easy it is to get this stuff. Yeah, we're, we're there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's how hard it was. Uh, it's, sorry. <laughs> this ain't rocket scientists. <laughs> I've been working with rocket scientists. Uh, so, so this is the uh, Spokane portal. Yeah. Uh, and you can see the LIDAR portal, DNR, Washington, got gov. Uh, the downside, however, is, well, that's the Washington part. Idaho, you're on your own. Uh, so, oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so there's a few places where they overlap. Uh, but here's what's kind of frustrating is this friggin' black hole right. in the middle of the Scablands, the right. most important part where we want to go. Yes. They don't have LIDAR data for it yet. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. Blake and, and things. So, uh, yeah. so, so this LIDAR data is here. Okay. And then the, uh, uh, the, the uh, USGS has a similar site. Uh, to do so, okay. so, yeah. I mean, this is this is. Uh, oops, back up here a little bit. I screwed it too fast. So you can see all the lidar data. You can turn it on. Uh, I can hide it here to see. Oh, we're in Colotus, and then I can turn it back on and see. Hmm. But uh, here you can see there's the. That's amazing. That's Palouse Fall, or that's Devil's Devil's uh, Staircase there, mm -hmm. uh, where the where the water overflowed and, and lidar makes it so so easy to understand. Uh, here's uh, Palouse Falls, yeah, and uh, and that gorge. So, yeah, the black and white lidar uh, is, is certainly is certainly there. Uh, but i uh, the, the 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 color the color lidar just kind of even oh, adds more. It uh, does to it. It does. Uh, oh, thank you. See things, so so uh, our, so this what we're looking at right now is this on my website? One of these? Yes, this is, okay. Yeah, this lidar file is out on the uh, out on your website, and Under, people can download. It's a little bit larger file, okay. and it's it is it's just this, but it's it's out on your website. You do download it like any other Google Earth file, uh, and uh, and it's a layer uh, like like everything else in Google Earth, so you can. Uh, you can turn it on and turn it off uh, just by unchecking the boxes in, in, in Google Earth. Uh, the last thing I was going to show you is you asked just a bit ago. Uh, yes. So in Google Earth, I'm just going to pick a year here. Uh, when you click on Google Earth and select the folder like that, there's a little folder button right here. Thank you. And that, oops, if I click on it here. What that does is start a tour, hide this, and it will it will fly us around uh, to each spot once it paints here. Uh, oh, yeah, hang on. Stop this for a second because I forgot to check the boxes. Okay. You must have the. You must have the. Uh, where are we going here? Let me start again. I I apologize. We it's okay. Twenty nine. We're doing this live. Yep. You know that. I sure do. 27 field notes. They sh you have to have the box checked here to show up. We'll okay. Click the, click the zoom again. And it should fly you around to these spots. There's Pocatello. Uh, uh, and then it will yeah. pop up a, a brief, uh, uh, the, the brief details about Pocatello. Uh, and then uh, there's actually some settings where you can tell it to how long you want to sit there. Okay. And now it's going to go, it's going to start working its way up the, uh, up the Snake River Canyon. Here's Bliss. Yeah. And uh, where he was looking at the giant landslide uh, there at Bliss. Uh, I have the city for, I have it set for about five or six, seven seconds. Sure. Uh, and it's going to fly to, uh, 
Now here where it looks like Arlington. Yep, Arlington Delta. Uh, uh, I tell you, it, you, if somebody else goes through this exercise and looks at all these spots, you have a whole new understanding of the geography of central Washington, and you start recognizing these places. So it's a great way to learn from your chair uh, where, uh, oh, there's your college there. So he was on yeah. the Ellensburg Plain uh, in 1927. Uh, so this just starts flying you around. Here's uh, potholes. Uh, and uh, and this just follows his order of his notes. So you, you are following the order in which uh, uh, Brett's walked around or drove around in 1927. So he goes to cataract and he goes over to where this well is. Huh. And, and what I've done also with Google Map, uh, besides uh, getting the kind of the correct view angle, is in Google Maps, you can determine the date of the imagery you're looking at. And, and sometimes it's better to get older imagery than some of the new stuff. This uh -huh. is a crater cataract. Yeah. Uh, that he writes about. So I've gone through and, and kind of picked the best years of, uh, of, uh, of data uh, to, to, to emphasize the, uh, the coolies, or I'm sorry, to emphasize the details as much as we can. Uh, so this will just run through a, a, a year's worth of observations. I huh. uh, just sit back and, and, and drink your uh, uh, right. coffee or whatever and, and, yeah. let it, and let you follow him around. Huh. Uh, and again, anytime you want to stop uh, on this, you could just, it, it'll just stop. You can go out and see the field notes for that spot right there. So the field notes, if you're, if you're more curious, uh, you can stop the tour down the lower left-hand corner and go to the notes and then come back to the tour and pick it up. I but see. Here's, this is Trinidad. Uh, and, and again, you know, for, for this type of geology, uh, I don't know how you could beat Google Earth to, to be able to see it without having to go there. Yes, exactly. Uh, and, to, uh, and I learned you know, from, from reading his notes and then going to the spot and have him describe the notes, you could learn a lot about geologic forms uh, just by having him translate that. So this is the potholes bar. I know there's a, this, gu this gully now, it's called a foss, fossy foss. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. And so you say, okay, I can see that. Now I know what to look for when I uh, see a, a, a foss. Yeah. Uh, there were no gravel bars in Brett's notes that were not spectacular. <laughs> he called everything a spectacular bar. <laughs> uh, and uh, But after looking at 100 gravel bars uh, <laughs> with Google Earth, uh, yeah. after a while you start, uh, start getting them. But... Uh, uh, this is a fish hatchery that he was at. It was a fish hatchery back in 1927. It's still a fish hatchery today yeah. at Rocky Ford. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so that's a tour uh, that uh, that I was talking about. That you could, it, it's it's addicting, as you as you well know. Well, yeah. yeah. It, let's 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 stop your share, and maybe we'll do some final thoughts here. Just two yeah. heads on screen. Um, thank you for your time today, and. Thanking you for all this time is is uh, woefully uh, it's not strong enough, and that begs me to my I guess my last question. I have heard from enough people where they're worried that all of this amazing stuff that's been compiled over the past winter. Obviously, you're the star, but there are others who contributed major amounts. How to properly credit the folks, and maybe as important or maybe more important how to store it somehow in addition to my website uh, that can then get used for many, many years to come. I don't know. Well, I, mean, I don't know. I don't know what to do. I don't, I, do you have any ideas? Yep. <laughs> of course. Uh, on my calendar next Wednesday is a meeting with the Ice Age Floods Board of Directors to talk about having the Ice Age Floods host at least by Google Earth stuff, uh, you know that's a that's a great group that's that's going to outlive all of us. Right. Uh, so I'm going to talk to them next week about the Google Earth stuff. I want to uh, uh, talk about how I want to make sure that they have permission to host all of the the Brett's material and and maybe the Pardee material and maybe the Flint material and all that stuff. But uh, so I think the intent right now 
as we work out some of the technical details and things is to have to work with the United States Floods Institute. Uh, I can't think of a better group, uh, more appropriate to, to do some of this stuff. Okay. Uh, so I thought we would visit uh, after that meeting and we could work out how you Good. might want to do that. Well, yeah, and the viewers, you know, like like always, the viewers, the comments below this video right now, there'll be a, a bunch of other uh, creative ideas about, about how best to do this. And uh, we will learn from the viewers about that, just like we have from all these other things. But sure. um, yes, the goal is to not have all this stuff sit for 100 years without anybody looking <laughs> yeah. at it, just, just like, you know. Uh, we've we've brought a bunch of this stuff to life, and um, who knows how it will be used. But like you say, even if people, okay, I, I was making videos a couple of years ago uh, coming out of COVID, and I said, here's a video, and here's a point on the Google Maps, and punch it into your phone, and come out and see this thing, and and enjoy it. Well, why couldn't somebody spend? Uh, I don't know how long it would take. Uh, Spending three weeks following Brett's in 1927, using all yes. your pins and everything else. Like, that would be fun to hear about people doing that or, or whatever. Go to one spot and read all these notes from the different years. It's all there now for folks to use. So and that's that's all you. So Well, and I hope, it, you know, and actually I hope that some of the readers do that. Uh, I, I had, uh, uh, when we first started this and, and we, we talked and, and we did the first show, uh, you at the end, you laughingly said, "Well, okay, so that's the first year of notes, Glenn. Uh, what about the other ten years that you're going to do? Like, what? There's ten years of notes? Holy crap! What did I get myself into? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And I think I told you that, like, well, I was going to go out and photograph all those sites. Like, yeah, right. Well, that's right. not going to happen. Uh, right. Not at fifty or two thousand places. Uh, right. But but it still would be it, it's it still will be interesting to see to have viewers go and chase it. I mean, yes, you could. Somebody could put a, a commercial travel guide together and go trace the breadth's routes. Yes. Uh, and I think with the Ice Age floods people, uh, that they could do just that, is that, that people are reading about it, go there, find these places, let's get, take a vacation and go visit Brett's. Uh, and yeah. so I mean, I, I've, I've started actually baking that into some of our vacations. So uh, nice. we're going up to uh, BC this summer and uh, and check out some of the spots in BC. And, yeah, so. Uh, so oh. I'm going to do some of that, but I can't do 15 or 2,000 sites. No, no. Well, I mean, I think many, uh, that would be fun. I just realized that right now talking to you, that'll be fun to see how many people go out and see some of these sites as a direct result of, of your efforts and how easy it is to get that stuff into their phones and everything else so that they can yeah. they can follow along. Okay, well, hang on for just a second, Glenn. I want to talk to you once I stop the recording, but before I stop, Thank you so much for this today. We'll post this a little bit later today. And uh, viewers, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Glenn. Thank you, Glenn. Thanks. Goodbye. Thanks, yep.